This meeting is being recorded. So hi everyone, this is Dr. Naidu again. Welcome to this episode of Thinking It Through with Dr. Naidu, child psychiatrist. Today we're talking to Pyle Aurora. Pyle and I actually crossed path back long ago in college at UPenn. Um, and she is a graduate of the Wharton School of Business and also has her MBA from Columbia. After spending over a decade in finance, she has shifted gears completely to pursue her passion in encouraging the health and wellness of others through health coaching. So Pyle is the CEO and founder of Aurora Wellness, a platform to help transform lives through personal health coaching. She's a certified functional medicine health coach and provides both individual and group coaching. And her mission is really to encourage healthy living through step-by-step -step changes that are both obtainable and sustainable, mm -hmm. right? That's always the key, maintenance. Yeah. She mm -hmm. is also an avid tennis player, a mom of two, and understands firsthand how hard it is to juggle the needs of being a career woman and a mom. And as a child psychiatrist, I see firsthand how incredibly challenging it is for moms to balance their own mental health, especially when they're trying to help their own child through their own mental health mm -hmm. crises and issues and to support their family, right? Because that's what we as moms do. Mm -hmm. So given that the holidays are approaching, I thought it'd be really timely to chat with Pyle and learn more about what action-oriented steps all moms can take to help encourage their own mental wellness and balance through this very hectic time. So I'm super excited to welcome and chat with Pyle Aurora on this episode of Thinking It Through with Dr. Naidu, child psychiatrist, healthy through the holidays with Pyle Aurora. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Dr. Naidu. It's so awesome to be here today. And I'm so excited to be talking about this topic that I hold very near and dear to my heart as well. So thanks for having me. Oh, no problem. Is there anything you want to add to your bio or anything that? No, it, you really covered it. <laughs> so, and I will talk more about everything, but yeah, you got it. So for people who are listening, um, you know, Pyle and I met at, at UPenn. UPenn is an Ivy League school. And when we start college, we start college around 18, right? 17, 18, 19. And to get there, it's it's pretty stressful. We work really, really hard. There are many, many years of hard work creating a, a really strong CV and strong portfolio to be a cut above the rest, especially to get into a place like Wharton. So I'm really curious after doing that and then going to Columbia and doing business, how did you shift gears to health coaching? How did you find this? Um, how did you be brave <laughs> get brave enough to make these It's choices. a good question. It's a really good question. So yeah, you're right. I spent a lot of years focused on sort of the goal of going into finance, um, starting my career there. I, you know, after spending a few years in investment banking, I sort of shifted. I started to shift gears actually quite early on. If I look back at it, um, I took a year after banking for a few years completely doing something different. I went and I worked for a nonprofit in the city that was working with children because uh -huh. I knew that was dear to my heart. Like I wanted to be able to help people. I knew early on, I wanted to be able to help people, but I also knew that I wasn't going to be a doctor because that wasn't my calling. Mm -hmm. So I think starting sort of a few years out of banking, I was like, okay, well, this isn't my path, but what is? So I started to sort of explore and, you know, early on, I went back to business school. I was uh, I was actually focused on marketing. I ended up in a financial firm doing marketing mm. out of business school, um, which was great, but it wasn't <laughs> because, you know, it was a job. It wasn't a calling, right? And I did it because, you know, it was you know, well-paying. It was good life work balance. I could live in New York City, which is what I wanted to do at the time. And... But I knew in my heart of hearts that it wasn't it wasn't what I was passionate about, right? Mm -hmm. And so it was it wasn't until after I had children actually that I took a real pause and looked at my life and reassessed and found that, you know, I wanted to do something I truly cared about that lit me up from the inside that I knew could help other people. And so, that's really where my um, my exploration started of like, what could I do that was that that met that for me? Yeah. And I was very passionate throughout my life about health and wellness. I was, you know, I played all these sports growing up. 
And then I moved to Manhattan and I couldn't play sports and I started running because that was one thing I could do in Manhattan. Right. And I trained for multiple half marathons. I ran multiple half marathons and marathons. Um, so, you know, that was always a part of my life and a very important part of my life. And I knew that was something I really cared about because I always have believed that without your health, you can really not have anything. Right. I think it has to be the basis of everything. Um, so I was, you know, looking for what can I do that marries that passion for health with, you know, helping people, right? But not being a doctor. <laughs> I was like, what can I do? Um, and so when I had children, I sort of went through a mini, you know, crisis of my own, realizing after having spent all my life being good at everything, that I wasn't very good at being a mom, yeah. or at least that's how I felt, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Because oh, no. all fell right, especially in the beginning. beginning. Yeah, in the beginning, yeah. I was lost. I was confused. I was getting advice from three million different places, and it was it felt hard. And I was like, "Why is this so hard? Everyone makes it look so easy, you know." Especially with social media and all these influencers, and you're like, "Well, they can do it, and they can look amazing doing it. Why is this so hard for me?" Right. And I um. It wasn't until I started chatting with other mothers, you know, with similar age children or babies mm -hmm. that I realized it's not just me. Like this is hard for everybody mm -hmm. and we just don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. You know, we try to put on this face of like, oh, I'm amazing at this and like I've got this and everything's under control. Well, meanwhile, a lot of people are struggling, you know, and and I found that I wanted to really help moms. That's really where my passion was because I felt like, and I still believe this, every single one of us has a gift to give to the world. Agreed. And unless we are at our best in terms of our health and our wellness, and, and we'll talk about what that means because health is so much more than just running and eating. Well, it's so much more. Mm -hmm. um, but unless we're at our best, we can't give our gifts to the world. It's really hard to share that gift, you know? And so that's where sort of my passion met my purpose. Cause I was like, this is what my purpose is meant to be. It's meant to help women and mothers because I, you know, I saw how much of a cornerstone women are in their families, in their communities, in their sort of everywhere. And I was like, this is a need that is not being met in very many places. So that's where I came upon like this idea of health coaching as a foundation um, and then started my practice just focused on helping women and mothers. Um, and and then that's where I started. But then it's funny because I found the health coaching piece was great, but it wasn't deep enough. Like it was like I, I women would come to me and they'd have these hormonal issues and things that I couldn't help with because I didn't have that training. So then I went to functional medicine. Because that's where the training became so much deeper, where now I kind of could understand, okay, your hormones are way out of whack. Like, let's start to try to uncover the root cause of why that's happening and what changes we can make to sort of help rebalance that. So that's where the functional medicine piece came in for me. Wonderful. That's amazing. Yeah. I think that um, I really appreciate you being honest with having points of reflection as kind of starting from a point of especially for people like um, high achievers like us who have always mm -hmm. been high achievers naturally. Mm -hmm. I do think that for us, even more so than, than other women, I, I think uh, that point of motherhood and the realization that, oh my God, I have to learn so many things and mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm learning the right thing and there's no clear path. Mm -hmm. uh, I think all new mothers navigate these waters and they're, they're you know, sometimes very rapid and yeah. tricky and difficult to navigate through. And I think it's um really inspiring that you've you found a way to reach them. And mm -hmm. you know, I thought, and I think it is much better than those first three years. For me, those first three years are really hard. The first three months yeah. were the hardest and the first three yeah. years. But every day there's a new challenge with kids, right? They're growing oh, that's they the love, thing. They push you, they encourage <laughs> you. And one of my um attendings in in fellowship would say when he met a parent and a child in treatment for the first time he would turn to the children and say you did a fantastic job raising your parent and yeah. didn't get it until I had kids now right. I realize oh right that makes sense that makes sense yeah, yeah. but um yeah. but yeah it's really tough so I, I'm 
I want to touch upon the functional medicine piece because, you know, in psychiatry and mental health, mm-hmm. we are also now really trying to understand the root cause of why yeah. mental health care concerns coming up and integrative medicine, functional medicine, going back mm-hmm. to understanding um, lots of different aspects of how our health, imp- mm-hmm. our physical health, the health we don't see impacts the mm-hmm. health we do see and what we experience. Yeah. So I think um, definitely um, chatting about that would be great. Can you tell us a little bit about what functional medicine means? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So functional medicine is multiple ideas. So one is that your whole body is connected, right? It's not just your heart is separate from your gut is separate from your brain is separate, you know? So I think that's one big difference from traditional Western medicine, right? Is that oftentimes when you have an issue, you will go see a a specialist, right? right? You will go to a heart doctor, you go to a gut doctor. But I think functional medicine is that idea that actually everything's connected. So let's look at, um, and 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 the it's also the idea that you have to look for root cause, right? And so root cause may be somewhere that's very separate in location from where the symptoms are presenting, right? So for example, you know, we talk to a lot. I, I see a lot of women who um, who are struggling with their hormones, right? And so they may be losing their hair, they may be having a hard time, you know, losing weight, they may have tremendous mood swings, and they don't know what's going on. And it's interesting, because, you know, after learning a bit of functional, you understand, well, that's probably related to your thyroid. But what is causing your thyroid to be in dysfunction, right? And potentially, the root cause could be in your gut, you know, maybe you're actually experiencing a lot of dysbiosis or like imbalance of gut bacteria, or maybe you're struggling with some hidden food sensitivities, or maybe you have enhanced intestinal permeability. All of these things can lead to tremendous inflammation in the body, right? And that inflammation doesn't sit locally in the gut necessarily. It can travel. That can impact your thyroid. That can impact your hormonal balance. And then you see symptoms like losing your hair, like inability to gain weight. So functional medicine is the idea that it's almost like a layered approach of trying to dig down and understand what is the most upstream root cause of what is happening. And and, and therefore you're seeing these downstream sort of symptoms manifest. Absolutely. And that's a fantastic explanation. And I think, mm-hmm. um, I think more fields of, of medicine are trying to learn about what the root cause is because we yeah. oftentimes are reactive in our medicine practices and not proactive. Mm-hmm. And functional medicine is really trying to be proactive, preventative, and try yeah. to, as you said, the most upstream cause. I think that's so important because yeah. otherwise we end up kind of taking care of the surface stuff, but not taking care of what's like really behind um, right. happening. And I think, um, mm-hmm. that takes a more nuanced approach and comprehensive mm-hmm. approach because mm-hmm. it's not just like, Oh, your hair is, you're, you're losing your hair. Take this pill. No, it's like really, right. to, what are all the facets that are going on? Mm-hmm. And I also want to say like for my, I will use hair loss as just disclosure. Right. So I have yeah. been dealing with hair loss for a while and I saw my, my allopathic doctor, my family mm-hmm. care doctor, he had right. no idea what was going on. He's like, okay, let's run some labs, look at the labs everything looks fine. He's fine. Yeah. I'm mm-hmm. like, well, something's not fine. My hair is falling out. Right. So then I go to see a naturopathic doctor. So mm-hmm. she runs different labs, goes through mm-hmm. all those labs and she finds different things because she is running different mm-hmm. labs. So then she fixes mm-hmm. whatever she feels um, based on those labs need to be fixed. Mm-hmm. My hair is still falling out. So then mm-hmm. we're assessing again, what to do. So then I see like all these different specialists sorted out. Yeah. And looking at your website, looking at your work, I wish there was someone like you. I wish there was a coach to really, I mean, I'm a physician and I'm talking to all these physicians, but we're still using yeah. different language and we're yes. still connecting to each other. The yeah. naturopathic doctor, the allopathic doctor, the dermatologist, the rheumatologist, yeah. all of them are speaking different languages. And yeah. even as a physician, mm. it's hard for me to navigate and make sense. What are they yeah. actually saying? Because yeah. they're all speaking from their their perception of what Specialty is the cause. Their pers- right. and if it's not the cause that they know oh well we don't know what to do you know so right. you right. kind of need someone I think there, there's truly a benefit for someone like you to kind of have that ability to to explain the connection between them yeah. and really to take more of a holistic approach versus the systems-based approach 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I can't agree more. And it's, it's really interesting because obviously the people I support, they're seeing all their doctors and as they should be right. Like this does not, what I do does not replace medical care. That is still extremely important in everyone's lives. And I think you're right. Part of my role is often asking them, okay, show me what your doctor had you do. What labs are they running? Like, you know, could they, could you ask them to actually run these additional labs? Because perhaps there's something there they're not catching. And although, you know, and, and it's tough, it's a tough balance, right? Because I'm not trying to step on any doctor's toes. Obviously you doctors have so much knowledge and so much training, but sometimes there is a different point of view that we can bring to light as a coach, right? So I'll give an example with going along with that thyroid piece. A lot of times endocrinologists, they do, um, they'll test TSH, which is, you know, a very common lab to look at, but they won't often test free T3, free T4, reverse T3, which are additional thyroid markers. Now, if your TSH looks fine, they may say you're fine, right? However, what we're not seeing there is what's the conversion from your free T4 to your free T3? Right. And is that actually converting to reverse T3, which is um, which is an inactive form of T3? And that can happen if there's a lot of stress. And if your hormones are not converting to that active T3, you're going to start experiencing symptoms of subclinical hypothyroidism. And they may not see that because they didn't look at those labs because they weren't trained to look at those labs. But I think the functional piece is that we're starting to learn. And I think that we should be looking at a more holistic picture of those labs, right. you know? And so my job is to then coach my client to say, go ask your endocrinologist to please run some more labs and look at this and see if that is an issue. And if not, okay, good. We'll explore another area, but let's look more. Right. Let's look deeper. And I think that that advocacy for patients is really important mm -hmm. because, you know, if I am more informed, I can speak for myself. I can be clear with what I want. I can ask my physician more appropriate questions, more helpful questions. Yeah. I think the other part um, that I want to bring to attention is things like TSH. I think one of the challenges with allopathically trained physicians, which I am included in, is we look for disorder. We look yeah. for disease. Yes. So if the TSH, the thyroid stimulating hormone, which is a kind of a general marker that even a psychiatrist mm -hmm. like me does, we look for being within range or out of range. Right. If you're out of range, then you're flagged and we follow up. But if right. you're not out of range, it's almost right. like that is really not our specialty to deal with yeah. that health. We are right. dealing with the disease. So I think yes. that's a whole part of functional medicine and, and health coaching is to really help those who are looking for optimal health it's and those who are at risk for developing yes. a disorder who want to catch yes. it before it's a problem. That's so true. That's so true. How many times have I helped a patient or client look at their labs and say, but, but it's in within normal range. And I have to say, yes, but let's, yes. It, it's within normal range, but that does not mean it's optimized, right? right. There right. is actually a lot of dis-ease within normal ranges. And that's a really um, good point that you're making. And I think that is something definitely that we do through functional medicine is try to look to optimize wellness. So you're right. And with mental health and, and medical health, I think we forget there's a spectrum and the spectrum, the spectrum does not mean cutoff. We all have mm -hmm. variability in our responses to, we'll just say TSH, right? It may be the same level for you and I, but I may re respond yeah. with sub therapeutic, subclinical yeah. some symptoms. And for you, that might be totally fine. So, yeah. so I think that there's so much variability within how we can function mm -hmm. And I think one of the benefits of working with someone like you is that although there's that variability, we do have some control. We can work yeah. on some things. Yes. Look for, right? So I'm curious about, because we're, we're I'm, a, I'm a psychiatrist and talking mm -hmm. about health, what are some things that women may come to you for that are in the mental health care realm that they may not realize mm -hmm. actually has a functional medicine underpinning? Interesting. So... <sighs> So what are some things in the mental health? I mean, to be honest, so a lot of people are very, very stressed, 
right? So they come to me and maybe they come to me because they're not able to lose weight or maybe they come to me because, you know, they want to, they just want to feel better by the holiday season, right? And so they ask, what can I be eating or what, you know, what can I change in my diet and what can I change in my routines to sort of, to get there? But not knowing that actually, if we don't work on your stress, no matter what you eat, it's going to be very challenging for you to lose that weight, or it's going to be very challenging to make any other changes. And so that's a prime example that I see all the time, really, of of women who who don't realize or maybe don't pay enough attention to those sources of stress and managing that to understand that if we can't get a handle on that, the rest is really, really not going to make your, it's going to be hard to move the needle in any of those other areas. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, very often we'll start with, okay. I, I, and I get it. Everyone's stressed, right? That's the, the society we live in. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's stressed. Everyone's functioning on running 300 miles a minute. And that's just because we have children, we have families, we have jobs, we have everything going on. And I get that. Right. But at the same time, if we do not take a real look at what that stress is doing to our bodies um, and our minds, it's really hard to move the needle on your health. It really, it, it's almost impossible, I would say. And so. I think I also want to, especially with the holidays where moms are pulled in so many different directions, yeah. sure. I think more than than typical we also if we're stressed we receive feedback from our world reminding mm. us that we're stressed i mean yes. in blogs you had this fantastic <sighs> quote in response to someone saying oh you look so tired because yeah we are tired yeah. and you're oftentimes i've heard that and been like i i don't look that bad do i look that bad <laughs> like i must look horrible if you're telling me i look tired but your response on the blog was yes i'm tired and that's okay because my life is so full yeah, I think that's such an amazing reframe, a, a different mm. way to, to really reflect our thoughts in a more self-serving mm. way, because mm-hmm. when we are stressed, I think it's so easy to feel like a failure. Mm-hmm. Like we're not, we're running, but we're not catching up and everything's mm-hmm. piling up. And then that just grows and it becomes mm-hmm. harder to get out right. of the weight of that stress. Right. So how might you work with a mom who's dealing with yeah. that? You know, yeah, so there's a mom that is, it's the holidays, you know, she's, thinking about Thanksgiving. She's hosting Thanksgiving. She's thinking about Mm. Christmas. She's, you know, balancing the budget. Kids are home from school and she's feeling stressed. She's trying to lose weight. Um, It's worried about Thanksgiving and keeping her goals. How would you walk her through that? Yeah. So hopefully I would have started working with her before the holidays, number one, because I do, and we talked about this at the beginning, I do believe in small steps to make sustainable change, right? It can't happen all at once and it won't. Um, I think part of our problem is that we try to set these big goals for ourselves. I want to lose 20 pounds. I want to, you know, like manage all this stuff without being stressed out. Let's, I think the first step is take a step back. Mm -hmm. Let's set some realistic goals, right? And what I mean by that is, we have to take small steps to create habits that then can stick over time, right? So the first thing is that I always look at is, are you sleeping? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and if not, why not? And we need to fix that first and foremost. So That's I true. really believe that sleep is the number one foundation for anybody to be able to be healthy. Um, how and come? How come? How come sleep is so important? <laughs> Because so one, when you don't sleep and and many moms have experienced this through, you know, having a newborn at home or whatever, over extended periods of time, the chronic stress that puts on your body does tremendous amounts of damage. Okay. So it is a chronic form of stress, not getting sleep. It's actually, you'll look up, it's a form of torture (laughs) that sustained periods of lack of sleep is a form of torture. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's a fundamental need your body has. And if we don't allow our bodies to have rest, there is no repair happening. 
So during rest, during sleep, and during our deep sleep cycles is when our body replenishes hormones, it's when our immune system replenishes, it's when our cells rebuild, it's when so many things are actually happening in our body. And I'm sure a ton of stuff is happening in the brain that you can talk about. So your, you know, your neurons are replenishing, so many things are happening, that if we don't allow our body that time, none of that can happen. So physiologically, our body cannot function as it's meant to function if we are not allowing for that sleep to happen. So that's number one. Um, and then, and yeah, go ahead. Also is a big risk factor for suicide. Mm -hmm. if chronic insomnia is a big risk factor for stress, resilience, and tolerance. And if you are sleep deprived, you don't go through all the stages of sleep, which are restorative. So you end mm -hmm. up skipping several of the stages and then that just, that depletion grows and grows. So I yeah. definitely agree with you. And I, so many of us don't really value sleep and yeah. how that really impacts everything else. So yeah. I think that's so important you start there. And, and I also, like, I've seen this happen with many of my clients. If you don't sleep, it's very hard to make good decisions the next day. True. It's It starts in the morning, right? You, you don't feel well. So you start to reach for perhaps more sugary snacks or an extra cup of coffee because you need something that will boost your either adrenaline or that caffeine rush or that sugar that your body's craving to give you energy. But those are not the choices that are going to make you healthy, right, in the long run, because that's sort of just finding band-aids to cover up what's happening. You're not actually resolving anything, right? And then again, like you said, that's like a downward spiral that just keeps going. And so healthy habits have to start with that foundation of sleep. And then I would say, if you're sleeping well, like the other thing, there's a few other things. Hydration, I think is also extremely important. Most people don't realize they're dehydrated most of the time. I know, right? My water is all the time. Yeah. But like women need to, everyone needs to hydrate and again, that's like a fundamental need that your cells have, they need to, they need to have that in order to function properly. Mm -hmm. And so hydration, and then the other thing is, um, oh, we're talking about stress, grounding, I think it's so important to make time, although you're busy, your schedule may be crazy, you you're hosting, you have a million things on your to do list. If you do not carve out time, just to in my mind, it, I call it grounding, but it could just be breathing, mm -hmm. or it could just be, you know, if you if you if meditation speaks to you, I am a big pro proponent of meditation, mm -hmm. um, or it may be gratitude journaling, mm -hmm. you know, something that speaks to you that allows you to sort of ground your mind and your body, and just enough that you have some clarity, right? Because when you are sort of thinking and stressing about stress comes from thinking about what has gone wrong in the past or what you could have done differently or what you have to do in the future it doesn't come when you are present and so this what i'm calling grounding is really a practice that allows you to be present mm -hmm. right i think those three things are the most important habits that must be in place um to just as a foundation go through this part of the you know the calendar where everything is just otherwise out of control and it's when you have these foundational pieces in place and you've hopefully been building on these over time leading up to the holidays then things become much more manageable right everything is not out of control the, the last piece is actually setting your own expectations, mm. right? And understanding, although we wish we were all superhuman, we're not. Right. There's boundaries on what we can actually accomplish um, with the intention of also enjoying ourselves, right. right? I think there needs to be some expectations set. So maybe that's, okay, I'm going to cook some prior to November, right? And use my freezer. Right. Or I'm going to call on my family to bring a dish. What's right. the big deal, right? Like I'm hosting, but everyone can pitch in. And why not? The more the merrier, right? When it comes to all that yumminess on the table, yeah. why not allow everyone to bring something? 
Um, I think a lot of it of the stress comes when we feel like we need to control every single aspect. Mm -hmm. um, the reality is we can't. And if we try, that's when we kind of drive ourselves crazy. Yes. So the understanding that we can rely on others, we can sort of, you know, tell ourselves, my goal is to enjoy this as much as I, you know, am hosting. I, I want to enjoy my family. I want to enjoy this food. And I'm not going to be able to do that if I take all this stress on. So what are some realistic expectations for myself? Um, and I think, yeah. um, I think, I think that's, that's a fantastic reminder, right? To be able to set our own expectations. And it makes me think also of giving ourselves the opportunity to let go of the mm -hmm. judgments of other people and how important that is like mm -hmm. setting up the expectation that mom will be happy and grandma will be happy and my dad mm -hmm. will have his favorite like double baked potato whatever it is i think that sometimes we especially as women and mom we want everyone else mm -hmm. to be happy and thrilled and enjoy yeah. their experience but we're not and it makes mm -hmm. me think of my own mom at thanksgiving or christmas or diwali we're all sitting at the table and she's going back and forth back and forth serving yeah. people and going in and fixing and i'm like just sit down and enjoy it, it be here mm -hmm. with us um and I, I think that it's, we are modeling what we've seen before. Yeah. We're modeling what we think will be the, the uh, process to be successful and right. measure our own joy by other people's mm -hmm. experiences of joy yeah. versus yeah. giving ourselves permission to be a part mm -hmm. of it as well. Yeah. So I think yeah. that, um, I, I, and I appreciate your grounding comment as well, because I remember when I was, when I had, my kids were much younger the days that I would get up a little bit earlier and have my mm -hmm. cup of coffee for 10 minutes before mm -hmm. chaos started, mm -hmm. that is really what set the tone of the day. And if I didn't get that 10 minutes for myself, so I would see that as whatever word makes sense to you in your practice, mm -hmm. whether that is filling your own cup first, whether that is serving yourself, whether that is taking time to connect to spirit, mm -hmm. but I think it's the time to remind yourself that, um, you know, I'm here for me too. Yeah, and give yourself that space because um, we have to be able to serve ourselves and take care of ourselves yeah. as a part of mm -hmm. taking care of others. Yeah, no, I think that's beautiful. And I, and I love the idea of having that morning routine. And what's funny is I've tried so many times to get up early and for me, it's tough, right? I'm not, I mean, if my alarm is set for six, because I need to get up and get going, it's set for six. I have a very hard time getting up at 545. So what I have found, and this may be a little trick that people can use, is actually the time that I get for myself is when I'm driving after I've dropped my kids off at school, because oh I have a 15 minute drive back home or to my office or wherever I'm going. And what I do actually is I put on a meditation and yes, I can't sit and close my eyes and be, you know, obviously cause I'm driving, but even just listening mm -hmm. and breathing for those 15, 10, 15 minutes while I'm driving, it's not the perfect ideal of a meditation, but it works because I set my intentions. I clear my head. I'm able to sort of carve that time out that that's already being used, right? I have to drive, but I've been able to sort of use that time in a way that's self-serving, right? And it's, it's, that's my time then, yeah. right? So maybe it's not getting up early, although I think that's ideal because then, you know, it's quiet, you have your space, you have your time, you can sit and have your eyes closed if that speaks to you. Um, but if not, then where in your day can you make that time? Can you carve that time for yourself? And maybe it's while you're driving or maybe it's when you're walking the dog or maybe it's when you're prepping dinner even, you know, there can be many times. It doesn't have to, this is the other thing about setting expectations. It doesn't have to look like it does for everyone else. Yeah. yeah, It has to work for you. Right. You know? And I think that there are ways we can reframe the thing mm. because the idea of adding something in for so many of us moms just mm. feels like so much. But if you're already doing something, you can reframe it just like you did with driving home. Yeah. You have to drive mm -hmm. home anyway, right? But right. you're driving home and you're being, you're using your multitasking mom mind to find a way to be efficient and effective in that time to give back to yourself. Mm -hmm. And I would challenge any person listening to this, how can we through the holidays find an existing routine and reframe mm -hmm. it to serve ourselves for this holiday? Yeah. Because there are yeah. tons of them. And maybe yeah. it's going grocery shopping. Maybe you go to grocery shopping and you put your podcast in or your yeah. routine in. 
Maybe it is at night before you go to bed, when you brush your mm -hmm. teeth, that's when you look in the mirror and you do your affirmations to yourself for, for two minutes. But there's so many ways that we can kind of add something in that just mm -hmm. um, is already there and just mm -hmm. set the intention and set the mindset that this is actually for me, not just for everybody else. And, and that's the other thing I wanted to say is that we need to get over the idea that doing things for ourselves is selfish, mm -hmm. right? I, I just, it's something that bothers me so much when I see women beating themselves up over not prioritizing themselves, right? Because it, it's not selfish to take care of yourself, mm -hmm. right? It, it is a fundamental need actually to take care of yourself. And if you don't, how in the world are you supposed to take care of everyone else mm -hmm. to your best capability, right? right? You like each of us has that gift, but if we are not taking care of ourselves, there is no way that gift is shining, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so if you think it's selfish, reframe that and say, I'm actually doing this so that I can better serve those people that I love the most mm -hmm. or those people that I care about or in my profession and my career, mm -hmm. right? And it's, it's, again, it's a reframe. It's about thinking about actually, I need to go for my run this morning, or I need to sit and do my 10 minutes of meditation, because that will allow me to give my gift to that, that everyone else deserves to have, right? Everyone else deserves to have that. So absolutely. And I think that especially as moms, and especially during the holidays, when we're doing so much for everybody else, yeah. I almost feel like in addition to selfishness, there's this feeling of of almost shame, right? Like I shouldn't mm -hmm. be doing this because that's taking away from mm -hmm. what I could give to other people. My energy, my time is limited. If I give this to myself, I don't have the energy to give to other people. But I think that it takes too much time. It it's not um it's not efficient. But I, I mm -hmm. think that it is again working on our thoughts and yeah. sorting out how we can figure out what we're actually doing right now and just yeah. think about it a little bit differently to give ourselves back mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But, but I agree. I think that, that there still is so much work to be done around our thoughts about giving to ourselves and doing things for mm -hmm. ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and I think having kids can also help us because I have to remind myself is that I am the message for my kids, right? Mm -hmm. What they're doing is what they're yeah. going to do. So when I say I'm going to go have a long bath because I need to take care of myself, like that is important messaging for them that, oh, yeah. mom needs this time by herself mm -hmm. that she can take care of me. And I don't know if you watch uh, Bluey. Bluey is this animation. I um, would Australia. love it. I, I haven't watched a lot, but I've heard from other parents that it's actually oh, yeah. a really good show to watch. Yeah, they love it. So one of the one of the episodes, mom, the mom says she needs 20 minutes. And then when she takes that 20 minutes, the kids misinterpret that and they think mom doesn't love them anymore. So then oh. the dad distracts and there's this whole big thing. But then mom explains at the end that I just need 20 minutes so that I can kind of ground myself. She doesn't mm -hmm. use that language, but that's what she's doing so that I can come back out and take care of you. So yeah. I think that reminding ourselves as moms that what our children see us doing is what they mm -hmm. will model and do for themselves. That yeah. may be what pushes us to say, you know what? I think it is a good idea for me to take care of myself because I want my daughter to take care of herself. Exactly. To take care of himself. Mm -hmm. I want them to see a healthy representation of what that means. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. I love that. So what would be three, I, I think you kind of talked about your approach for functional medicine, but particularly during mm -hmm. the holidays, what would be three tips that you'd advise us women to kind of think about or do and implement during these very busy end of the year months to yeah. really be able to stay grounded and focused and still sane? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So one is make sure you're hydrated, okay? Drink at least half your body weight in ounces of water a day. If you're working out, you should be drinking probably more than that. Um, so that's number one. And I mean, water, not, not, you know, coffee, <laughs> coffee does not count. It actually dehydrates you. So that's, that's one. Two is, um, you know, I was going to say, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, carve out that time to ground yourself. Okay. I, even though it's busy and crazy, you can carve out whether it's five minutes or whether it's 10 minutes to do a practice that speaks to you. So if that's meditation, that's great. If it's, you know, literally taking a piece of paper and writing down three things that you're grateful for every single day. I love that because that trains your mind to start looking for the things that you're grateful for every day. And that's 
that's a beautiful, easy practice. Um, whether that's breathing, I love the four, seven, eight breath method where you inhale for four, hold it for seven, exhale for eight. You do that cycle four or five times. It literally takes one minute. And I teach every one of my clients that um, do that, do it in the morning, do it before every time you eat and do it at bedtime. That's when I tell my clients to do it because it, it, it indicates to your body to move out of sympathetic dominance, your fight or flight and into parasympathetic mode, which is your rest and digest, which is so important to actually do in during this time of stress. Um, and then so hydrating, grounding, and then I would say set your expectations realistically. That's something you need to do up front. So, you know, do it before everyone shows up at your door and yeah, yeah be realistic. And, and, you know, what do you want out of this? Think about what you want out of this time. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about your thoughts about anxiety, because I think for a mm -hmm. lot of women, they experience stress, but I think stress is a little different than anxiety. I'm yeah. curious how you would approach a mom that comes in saying, I can't manage my anxiety. I'm really mm -hmm. worried all the time. Um, yeah. How, how would you kind of look at that and advise yeah. them? So uh, a lot of times I refer out, I would refer to someone like you, right? A, a doctor with the training that can help someone that's dealing with anxiety. You know, I, I think functional medicine may, I don't know if it gets a bad rap, but you know, a lot of people think, oh, you know, you just replace medication with supplements. And I don't, that's not the purpose behind it. You know, there's this thought that you can get to the root cause and resolve through, you know, changes in lifestyle, changes in diet. Yes, maybe some supplementation is needed because a lot of problems stem from nutrient depletion or they stem from, you know, not um, having enough of something in your body. But I don't think medication is bad. I think medication is often needed. And so if anxiety is a real problem, maybe you should see a psychiatrist and maybe it can be someone who can actually prescribe something that can help you for a little while, you know, and I don't think that's a problem. I think we need to look at it as sort of a hand in hand approach that need to go together, you know, the allopathic approach and the functional approach. And I think they can go together. And so I will often refer people to doctors and I, and I will help them find someone in their vicinity that they um, can go to for help if they if the if the changes that we're working on if it all seems too much too right and i mean i would also say that the same exists for um medical practitioners for mm -hmm. allopathic medicine and i will just say for psychiatry i think that sometimes psychiatrists there's certain psychiatrists that really don't want to deal with supplements or think about mm -hmm. people with supplements mm -hmm. but i think that um they can, as, as you said, I think they can go hand in hand. There are mm -hmm. times where supplements alone can do the trick and mm -hmm. sometimes where medicine alone can do the trick. But my hope is that we can avoid all of that, right? Like if we mm -hmm. make the lifestyle changes and the, the thought yeah. changes that we don't need to do that, but mm -hmm. sometimes we do for a little bit. Um, yeah. So I bring up anxiety because I think a lot of women, a lot of moms resonate mm -hmm. with the idea of anxiety and stress. Mm -hmm. Where might you, how might you help someone think through whether they have just stress or anxiety? Hmm. So I think if I will say, I think the anxiety piece, and you should correct me because I don't know that I know the, ex the exact differences. Um, I would say that anxiety is more of sort of someone keeps thinking, 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 and it feels like it's out of control, right? Um, or it all just feels way too overwhelming. I would say that's probably more anxiety. Um, but even still, I mean, if we can't differentiate there, you don't always have to differentiate in my point of view, you go to the doctor and you talk about these things with the trained psychiatrist because they will help you differentiate and they will help you, um, understand if medication is needed or if there's another approach. So, so yes, I, as a health coach, I sort of know my lanes and when I meet someone who I feel is beyond something I have experience or ex expertise or knowledge about, that's when I will definitely refer them to a physician. And so, you know, it's a tough question. I don't know that I know the difference um, as well, but, you know, I have coping mechanisms and tools that I try to teach. 
And if that's still not working, then that's when we definitely need to seek help. So I bring that up because I think for, for the listener, for someone who, mm -hmm. um, because I, th I think anxiety is a very socially accepted term for mm. dealing with stress. And I think sometimes people can say, I have anxiety, but it's actually normal stress, or mm. I have anxiety and it's actually something much more severe and pervasive than anxiety. Mm. But I think it's important that listeners hear that um, just because you see a psychiatrist doesn't mean you're not gonna, doesn't mean you're gonna end up on medication. And just because right. you're a health coach doesn't mean that you're going to be pushed in one direction or the other, that we mm. can work collaboratively. We can work together mm -hmm. to figure out what works best for you. And mm -hmm. it's really finding the right, team you know mm -hmm. i think that for a woman that has anxiety and also difficulty losing weight has seen other doctors and feels like they're not hearing her i mm -hmm. think a combined approach where there is a psychiatrist and there's a health coach maybe mm -hmm. even a therapist mm -hmm. um or a family therapist maybe they need a nutritionist maybe they need yeah. uh, a personal trainer just kind of having people on their team to really support mm -hmm. and encourage them along yeah. their growth path whichever way it may go um, yeah and that we all have different approaches and ways to do that, but we can work mm -hmm. in tandem to help. Absolutely, support. absolutely. Yeah, I think the idea that you that you should assemble your team is really important, you know? And I think as women, we often, again, maybe there's shame around it. Maybe there's this idea that, you know, I need to be spending that time and resources on someone else, not on myself. But the truth is <laughs> we all need the support and, the earlier we recognize that and that we start to seek out that support, I think the better off we'll be. Yeah. And just in terms of, of finding a health coach, how would someone find a health coach like you? What would be the process? Yeah. Um, because I do think it's still a relatively new um, kind of person to add to yeah. your team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, there are directories, there's obviously word of mouth, um, I'm on Instagram. So there's multiple ways to find uh, health coaches. But um, so the for functional medicine, I went to the School of Applied Functional Medicine, and there is a directory online of all those that are certified through that um, functional who have the applied functional medicine certification. There's also the IFM, which is a well known the Institute of Functional Medicine. So you can go online there and you can find, and you can search by health coach. You can search by different modalities. I mean, there's there's def definitely physicians who have also gone through these programs and are certified. So you can even search on there for, you know, um, a cardiologist who is also a functional medicine trained cardiologist. So, so there's, um, I would say the directories are definitely the best way to go, but then also, um, just online. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I do always encourage, as, as you know, if you listen to my podcast, that the credentials are really important. People train for reasons. People mm -hmm. got extra, um, went through extra studies to become an expert because then they can guide you best. So I do always yeah. encourage them to make sure if you're seeking a health coach or a medical professional to check out those initials at the end and mm -hmm. figure out what they mean. So I think it's wonderful that you went to that additional training and you have that, that backing. Um, yeah. and have gone that extra mile to make sure you're doing right by your patients and clients. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you wanted to add for today um, about health coaching or functional medicine or women during the holidays and moms? Yeah. I mean, I think so the biggest thing too, is I would say, find your people, right? We talked about finding your team of support, but also I think find your people, like who is it that you can talk to about all this stuff, whether it's a professional or whether it's a friend. Um, I think we try to go it alone too often and then, and, and it's not healthy for any of us to do it that way. So I think it takes a village for more than just raising our kids. We have, we need our village around ourselves. So um, I think, you know, nurture those relationships. And we didn't talk about this, but one thing I wanted to say is health is so much more than just, you know, how many miles you run or what you're eating on a day to day basis It is absolutely the thoughts that you have. It is absolutely the relationships that you nourish in your life. It's the, you know, purpose that you find for your life. It's the, um, it's your career, it's your, you know, environment. There's so many facets to health. And I don't think that, I don't think somebody can be healthy if they're ignoring a lot of those other facets, right? Like I could run 10 miles and I can eat all the kale, but if my 
mind is, you know, unhappy, or if my relationships are, you know, if I'm not having a good time in my relationships, that doesn't mean I'm healthy, you know, it really doesn't. And so I think we have to really take that more whole, holistic, you know, whole with an W H O L E mm-hmm. sort of view um, yeah. of health. So I would say, I think you have to think about more than just what you eat and what you do with your body. Absolutely. And I think that's the challenge with mental health, right? I think we have for so long, society has put mental health as a separate thing than Mm -hmm. health when they're together, you know, you're absolutely together. So connected to your physical health. I mean, gut dysbiosis is just inflammation. That's all (laughs) very important to how, how we think, how we react inflammation. And I think we're still, we're still working to bridge that yeah. gap of misunderstanding that they are separate when they are so connected. Yeah. And I yeah. think that's why meditation can be so helpful. I don't know if you want to spend a minute to speak about how you use meditation in your functional practice. Yes. Oh my gosh. So I just want to throw out an, a really interesting fact that I learned um, through my training was that, you know, there's the gut brain access, right? Your brain is connected to your gut and there's a whole enteric nervous system that sits in your gut. So you have almost like two nervous systems, right? You have the one that's controlled by your brain, and then you have one that's actually controlled by your gut. And they are connected. Um, And actually 90% of the nerves um, are afferent from your gut to your brain. So they're actually, it's not your brain telling your gut everything. It's almost 90% the opposite, where your gut is informing your brain about what what is going on in your world. Um, And so that alone, like that fact blew my mind because I was like, they are absolutely connected. You cannot separate your mental health from the rest of your health. It is one and the same. And so um, just when I learned that, I realized, yeah, gut health is very important, but it affects more than just your body. So that that was really interesting. And so how do we use meditation for that? It, it helps actually... Um, I would say I use meditation to ground. Okay. So every day when I meditate, if whether, if it's in the car, obviously I'm not sitting with my eyes closed, but the first part that I do is all breathing because I focus on just that metered breathing. I talked about four, seven, eight, there's different variations of it, right? There's like box breathing. Um, But the whole idea is to um, indicate to your body that you're safe, that you're okay, that you can move out of the general fight or flight mode, right? Which is unfortunately a state that many of us spend too much time in. I mean, our body is designed to be able to be in that state, but it is also designed to have more time in parasympathetic mode, which is rest and digest. We're meant to oscillate back and forth, but in our society today, we spend way too much chronic time in that sympathetic dominance. Mm -hmm. And that does, it does a number on the rest of our body, okay? I'll give you an example. If you eat when you're stressed, your digestive secretions are reduced by more than 50%. So even if you're eating like the best salad that has all these great things in it, you're not even getting 50% of the nutrients out of it because you're eating it when you're stressed out. So just knowing that you, you, you can't live in that state of stress to be able to optimize your health. So this, you know, breathing is a way that you can actually move your body out of that state of stress. And so I always start my meditation sort of period with breathing. Now, if I'm sitting and I can be in a space where I'm safe and I'm quiet and I can close my eyes, then I spend the next 10 minutes, whether it's an app that I use, um, you know, there's multiple apps that have great meditation programs, like there's Headspace, there's Aura, there's, um, I love Peloton's meditations. I'm a big Peloton fan. Um, there's so many different apps out there. Just find one that you, that works for you. I put them on and I do the guided meditations. Um, there's also a program and a training that I went through called Ziva meditation that actually teaches you how to meditate without the guided meditations. Mm -hmm. Um, it's run by this woman, Emily Fletcher. She is fantastic. She has taught, you know, top CEOs of some of the biggest companies in the world. And she basically makes you understand why meditation will raise the quality and quantity of your work like tremendous fold Mm -hmm. because it's essentially the same like a 10 minute she says a 15 minute minute meditation is is more effective for your body than like a three-hour nap 
So essentially, you just become a lot more effective in the way you're thinking and the way you're able to sort of process information, everything. Um, and so if you if you're interested, that's a whole program that she runs and you can do it online. But I use that 10 minutes to sort of, I usually put on a meditation and I listen, or I try to do the Ziva method. And it's just a good way to start your day. You need to ground yourself. And so um, again, you know, in functional medicine, we learn that your body is always trying to adapt to the environment in which it's in. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and it's doing its best to adapt. Now it's up to us to try to create and foster an environment in which it can thrive, right. right? And so whether that's cleaning up your gut or whether that, you know, what's interesting is you have more thoughts in your day than the water you drink or the food you eat or the miles you run or anything else. Mm -hmm. So the biggest part of your environment is actually your thoughts. Yeah. So working on that thought process and using meditation to sort of of clear those thoughts and calm those thoughts and set the right intentions. That is so important for how your body will respond through the rest of your day. And so that's how I use the meditation. It's I know it's like I'm cleaning my mind. You know what I mean? It's like I'm cleaning those thoughts up and I'm setting myself up to allow my body to then thrive in that sort of environment. That's wonderful. I, I love the analogy of your your mental environment the thoughts that are in your mind that is really the biggest environment that you exist in mm. it's 100 mm -hmm. true i think it's a great reframe mm -hmm. and i think um you know i i just imagine some listeners may be saying well meditation is so hard i have so many thoughts in my mind like how can i just sit with no thought and i think mm -hmm. i want to just dispel that myth that that is mm -hmm. not the goal of meditation to yeah. the goal of meditation is not to get rid of your thoughts not no. to have a quiet space um, and there are many different types of meditation involved, mm -hmm. but one of the analogies that um, I have used was kind of if you are comparing your thoughts to being on a train platform, you know, from mm -hmm. York City, right? so you're in New York City and the trains are going by. It is the the goal is to get off of the train and just sit on the platform mm -hmm. and observe your literal trains yeah. of thought passing by, right. and yeah. not get attached to getting on the train, mm -hmm. not getting attached to who is on the train, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. just just observe them and notice the patterns of the trains of thought passing through mm -hmm. and what that may mean, because mm -hmm. that twofold not only gives you the insight of what the patterns are, but gives mm -hmm. you the distance between your mm -hmm. thoughts and yourself. And I think mm -hmm. that is such a crucial part of your health to realize mm -hmm. that you are far more than the mm -hmm. thoughts that you create yes, and that you exist beyond that. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that has, you know, multiple benefits for many reasons but I think that mm -hmm. uh, that's really important because I think we get so entangled in mm -hmm. our thoughts and what they mean when mm -hmm. sometimes they're just thoughts yeah and I think the same is true with feelings I want to just bring this up because I know a lot of women are often like I am angry or I am so upset right now or I am stressed when I think something that we need to start doing is say, I feel like I feel angry or I feel stressed or I feel because the difference is that your feelings are not who you are. Mm -hmm. They are something you're experiencing in that moment, but they are emotions. They are energy in motion, right? They're emotions. And so we need to start separating ourselves from that because like meditation, where you just explained that beautiful analogy of the trains, those emotions are also similar, right? They will pass, they, they will come and they will go, but we have to learn how to detach ourselves a little bit and understand that those are emotions, they are not your being, right? And I think that's the beauty of meditation too, is it teaches you your being is very separate from all of that, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I think same with thoughts is, is the emotions and we need to start learning and understanding that we can separate ourselves. And that's the beauty too, of being human. This is all only things that humans can do or that we know humans can do. I don't know if animals can do this, but, but that's the power we have of being human is that we have the minds to be able to understand this and think through this and actually know that we are separate and, and, and control that then, right? Yeah. Which is phenomenal. That also blows my mind that we have the power to control that, to make the choices. And, and I know you may ask this or you may not, but one of the most 
important things that anyone ever said to me, and my mom said it to me, was no one in your life is going to make you happy. Mm-hmm. Only you have the power to make yourself happy. Mm-hmm. And she said that to me, and that has spoken and, and rung true to me throughout my whole life. And I've realized I, you know, oftentimes we look externally for happiness, right? We look to our partners, we look to our children, we look to our jobs. None of that is going to make you happy unless you understand that the only thing that can make you happy is you, right? So you have to find that happiness somehow within you. And then all those things will make you happy, right? Because you see the beauty in each of those. But until you find that within yourself, it's very hard to see the beauty in all of the other things. So, yeah, so that's something that has always been true. And I hope to, you know, share that with other people, because I think part of my goal with my coaching is to help women and people see that there is beauty inside of you that you can uncover and find happiness within there. Awesome. Well, you have so many pearls of wisdom to share and I'm sure people listening would love to get in touch with you. What are some ways that they can learn more about you or follow you or even become a client? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I have a website, so it's aurorawellness.com, A-R-O-R-A wellness.com, or you can follow me on Instagram. It's pile Aurora wellness, P-A-Y-A-L Aurora wellness. Um, and those are probably the best ways you can always email me you'll find that through those two channels um and yeah i'm i'm actually going to be running another one of my sort of fall resets reboots i'm calling it a reboot this time it's a five-day healthy eating reboot where we'll just focus on whole foods so if you're anyone listening is interested we'll be um running that shortly so you can join in on that um more information on my website and yeah, I'd love to hear from you. Cool. When is that reset? What dates are they? Um, it's going, I haven't yet set the dates, but it'll probably, you know, be in November. So okay. yeah, so cool. that'll work. Mm-hmm. So we typically end with just a couple like quick, quick questions. Um, sure. So what are the top three things you wish you knew before becoming mm-hmm. a health coach? Oh, um, your first career is not, the end all be all. <laughs> um, give yourself time to explore your passions because I think it matters. And um, follow your heart too, that it's okay to do that. Awesome. And you did say what the best advice you've ever been given was from your mom. Yeah. She told me that um, no one else is going to make you happy in this life. Only you can do that. So. <laughs> So if you could finish these sentences, the most important thing in life is health. Health. <laughs> I didn't even say that right. That was easy. <laughs> easy one. Um, the most rewarding thing about being a health coach is oh, seeing positive change happen. Mm. I wish my struggling clients knew that. Mm. I wish they knew that health is a journey, not a final destination. And there are many paths up the mountain. Awesome. And the future of mental health care will be? Working hand in hand holistically with a team of professionals that can help people. (laughs) Well, Pyle, it's been so wonderful chatting with you today. Thank you so much for sharing your story and your wisdom and your inspiration with all of us here today. Thank you, Dr. Naidu. I loved being here. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Be well. You too.